Um, welcome uh, to the panel discussion, healthcare reform at the state uh, versus national level. Um, my name is Brian Jacob. I'm director of uh, Close Up, the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy here at the Ford School. Um, we are uh, co-sponsoring this event as a series of kind of panel discussions on various policy issues that we put together uh, over the course of the academic year. Um, I'd like to give a special thanks today to Matt Davis and Helen Levy for um, putting together all the sub substantive parts of this uh, panel. I'll be uh, uh, passing uh, the microphone along to Matt shortly to introduce the panelists. Um, I also want to make sure I recognize the Ford School of Public Policy as a co-sponsor and to give special thanks uh, for funding in part um, to the Gilbert S. Oman and Martha Darling Health Policy Fund. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank some of the Close Up and Ford School staff who have helped put together the, the logistics here. Uh, Bonnie Roberts, Joe Crane, Beth Rybar, uh, Tom Avaco. Uh, they've both been, or they've all been incredibly um, uh, efficient and uh, productive in putting together the panel. Um, so uh, I look forward to a, a great, enlightening discussion that is just incredibly timely now. Um, it's very convenient of the uh, legislature to, uh, to act when they did. Um, and so now uh, I'll pass along to Matt Davis to introduce the panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian, and good afternoon, everyone. We at the Ford School take it as a point of pride to be as timely and as relevant as possible in scheduling our events. And so it's no surprise that we are gathered here today to talk about health care reform, what is possibly the most momentous day in the last 18 months of struggle regarding health care reform in the US. Whether you are for or against this legislation, you could probably agree that to have the Congress actually pass legislation and agree on legislation about health care is a truly, perhaps once in a lifetime opportunity for many of us to live through. Of course, the President still has to sign it, but we might all agree also that actually President Obama signing this legislation is less momentous in a way than Congress actually agreeing on it and passing it. So I've had the pleasure of being parts of health care reform panels in the past, but it is a even greater pleasure today to be moderating this panel of a truly multidisciplinary group of talented researchers and thinkers uh, when it comes to health care reform. Uh, each speaker that I'm about to introduce will have 15 minutes to talk about what they see as the most salient issues regarding not just federal policy that we've all heard so much about in the last 18 months, but also state-level policy, particularly in our fair state of Michigan. Following each person's 15 minutes of presentation, then we'll have what I expect will be a lively Q&A discussion period. Let me introduce our speakers now. Our first speaker is Tom Buckmiller, who is the Waldo O. Hillebrand Professor, Hildebrand Professor of Risk Management and Insurance at the Ross School of Business. He uh, has been and continues to be a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research and has also been a visiting scholar at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. We've invited Tom to be part of the discussion today because of his work and his uh, incisive thinking regarding state level policies regarding expansions of coverage to vulnerable populations. Our next speaker will be Marianne Udall Phillips, who is the director of the Center for Healthcare Quality. Yes, the Center, for, the Center for Healthcare Research. The Center for. But we're transforming. You are transforming. The Center, I know it as chart, which is the Center for Healthcare Research and Transformation. It's not right here, but it's right up here. So, Marianne is the director of this innovative center, which is a collaboration between the University of Michigan and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. And in fact, Marianne has, was vice president. Uh, at the uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan for many years and then serves as the director of Michigan Department of Human Services under Governor Granholm. Marianne has been uh, a tremendously strong leader in the last couple of years now at CHART, <coughs> helping shape the debate within Michigan about where to go for health care and how, to, how it should look in the future. And, and we've asked her here today to contribute to our discussion of state health care issues regarding the insurance industry. Our third speaker this afternoon will be Dr. Joe Schwartz. Uh, Dr. Schwartz was trained in otorhinolaryngology, or as we better know it, ENT, ear, nose, and throat, uh, and had a career in the Navy and CIA before 
joining public service in an elected capacity as a city commissioner and mayor of Battle Creek. He subsequently served in the Michigan State Senate and thereafter in the U.S. Congress as a representative from the Battle Creek area. More recently, Dr. Schwartz has graced our faculty uh, and spoken to many Ford School students about legislative issues at the state and federal level, and that's what we've asked them to contribute today. So of course, the speakers may overlap in terms of their topics, but in general, what we've tried to do is cover the broad waterfront today on issues of state and federal health policy, and we look forward to your comments and questions. I'll now turn it over to Professor Buckman. is unbelievable to, to get the date just right between the, the, the day that it's, uh, it's passed in the House and the day before probably the President's going to sign it. It makes um, the job of the Speaker very difficult because all the political uncertainty uh, has made this talk kind of a moving target. Um, it seemed like just a couple weeks ago this was going to be a post-mortem and we were going to maybe talk about how after the failure of federal health care reform the states would be picking up the pieces. Uh, and maybe finding elements of the reform package that they could um, that they can act, could enact. Um, and I think there are some things that, that uh, in the current bill that build on what other states have done so far, and uh, we might have seen more of that. Um, but I think in terms of coverage, which is what I've been asked to talk about, the impact would be very <coughs> minimal. Um, the the bill that was passed yesterday uh, will have a bigger impact on coverage. Uh, I think the estimates are. About 31 million people will gain insurance. Um, and there's really two main mechanisms uh, for this, two main ways that insurance is going to be uh, expanded. One is an expansion of the Medicaid program, which is the, the joint state and federal program for, for low income people. And the other is the establishment of health insurance exchanges, uh, which would be a, a new marketplace where people who qualify for federal subsidies can go buy their insurance coverage. Um, now, these two pieces have comparable estimated impacts on coverage. So out of that 31 million people that are expected to gain insurance, it's estimated that 12 million will, will get Medicaid coverage. Um, the Medicaid expansions will essentially be extending coverage to uh, adults up to 133% of the poverty line. So for a family of four, that's a, a family income of about $30,000. About 12 million people are expected to get individual insurance through the, the exchanges, um, and the remainder would be people who would, who would gain employer-sponsored insurance. There may be some people in this room. Uh, one of the elements that, that deals with employer-sponsored insurance is um, uh, a new policy that would allow parents to keep their adult children covered on their employer-sponsored plans up to age 26. Um, so there's slightly less of a need to go out and find a job after grad school. <laughs> uh, I want to talk about uh, the two main pieces of the coverage expansions, the, um, the Medicaid expansion and the, and the exchanges. And just very briefly, um, just describe for each of them sort of a, a key thing to look at as, as these policies are implemented. Um, before I do, I, th I think it's useful to just sort of lay a little bit of background. Um, among the non-elderly population, I think the current estimate is around 17% of the population uh, is uninsured. Now that varies tremendously across states, and I think if you think about um, how this, uh, these policies are going to affect states, it, it's going to depend on the current state of affairs. So it covers the, the state with the highest rate of insurance coverage, the lowest percent uninsured is Massachusetts, and the current estimates are, I think, around 3%. Um, and the uninsured rate is highest in Texas, where it's up around 27 28%. And if you look across the map, uh, coverage tends to be highest in the Northeast and the Upper Midwest, um, and coverage tends to be the lowest in the South and the Southwest. And, and there's several basic variables that explain that variation in coverage. There's policy variables, demographic variables, and economic variables. Um, the key policy variable is, is how generous state Medicaid programs are to date. Um, so, so Northeastern states tend to have more comprehensive Medicaid programs. Um, in the South, uh, coverage is less generous, both in terms of um, the number of groups that are covered and, and, and the income level that, uh, where the income thresholds are set. Um, a key demographic variable is, is immigration. States that have high numbers of immigrants, um, high percentage of immigrants, tend to have lower rates of coverage. 
And so taking those two variables, um, states that now are, have, have ungenerous Medicaid programs, we would expect to see a large increase in coverage. On the other hand, states that have lots of immigrants, because the, the new um, expansions don't apply to undocumented immigrants, um, I think there's still going to be a, a large percentage of people that are uh, not covered and, and are going to be going to safety net providers. In terms of economic variables, it's important to keep in mind that 90 percent of private health insurance coverage is employer-sponsored, and so the factors that explain variation in insurance coverage are, are industry and, and, and job characteristics. Large firms are more likely to provide insurance than small firms. Manufacturing uh, firms tend to have high rates of insurance coverage, whereas service firms tend to have low rates of coverage. Um, and unions uh, have been very successful in bargaining for health benefits. So that explains why historically Michigan has had high rates of coverage, um, but, but that coverage is eroding. And that's where I think that the, uh, uh, the insurance exchanges uh, may be particularly uh, beneficial to Michigan. Now, in, in terms of the, the Medicaid expansions, the, the Medicaid expansions for adults really build on uh, two decades of, of the expansion of public insurance for children going back to the mid-1980s when Medicaid and cash welfare were delinked, um, the income thresholds for Medicaid coverage were increased, and then in 1997 there was the establishment of the state children's health insurance program. As a result of, of these expansions, in most states, children with family incomes up to 200 percent of the poverty line are eligible for public insurance, and as a result we see that, that the rate of uninsurance is much lower among children than it is for adults. So you take that 17 percent figure, um, that combines a 10 percent rate of uninsurance for kids and about a 20 percent uninsured rate for adults. And even among those uninsured kids, a lot of those kids really are covered or, or would be covered if they showed up at a, at a doctor's office or a hospital. So, so the program, that the, these prior um, expansions of, of Medicaid, uh, which, which throughout the expansions had pretty strong bipartisan support, um, can be seen as a really uh, important policy achievement. I mean, I think it, because it's been a gradual increase in coverage, it may not have gotten the attention um, that, that some bigger policies have, but, it, but it's been very successful at increasing coverage um, and increasing access to care. Now, now, Medicaid, as you probably know, is really 50 different programs. It's jointly funded by the, the federal government and the states, and um, with, with a lot of the coverage decisions being made uh, by the states. And one of the variables, or one of the decisions that, that's really critical to determining whether Medicaid coverage leads to better access is uh, decisions about how much the program pays providers. And one of the big problems with, with Medicaid, and one of the reasons we might be concerned that increasing insurance coverage, increasing the number of people with a Medicaid card, might not increase access to care, is that Medicaid rates are very low. They're, they're uh, extremely low relative to what private insurance companies pay. And as a result, um, a lot of people with Medicaid coverage have trouble getting, getting treated. So um, a recent study that, that Chart did did a survey in Michigan, and I think the figure was 35 percent of people with Medicaid coverage reported that they had difficulty finding a provider that would take them. You may have seen just last week there was a, a big article in, in the New York Times about this problem, um, and they, they focus on Flint as an example of, of a city where, because of high rates of, of unemployment, a lot of people on Medicaid and, and very low provider fees, that more and more doctors were saying that they couldn't afford to take Medicaid, um, and so there's a real access problem. And this access problem has gotten worse in the last recession, both because the Medicaid rolls have expanded um, and because states responding to budget problems have, have cut their fees. And so this is going to be an issue that's going to need to be addressed um, if this increased coverage is going to really lead to, to improved access. Now, the, the, the second piece of, of big expansion piece is these insurance exchanges. Insurance exchanges um, are basically a new market for individual insurance. It's, it's based on the model of managed competition, which again is not a new idea. Uh, managed competition has been at the center of health policy proposals for about 25 years. Uh, managed competition was, was uh, a key element of the Clinton plan. Uh, Medicare reform proposals and even Medicare Part D is based on the idea of a, of a managed market where people would have subsidies and they can go choose from a menu of, of private plans. So the, these exchanges would be a mechanism for distributing these subsidies, providing quality information about the plans, um, standardizing benefits, uh, enforcing the new market rules, uh, and essentially trying to harness the, the uh, uh, market incentives as a way to, to expand coverage and, and encourage competition among insurers. Now, the best example that we have 
of what an exchange would look like is the health connector that was established as part of Massachusetts reforms a few years ago. Um, another example is the employee benefits program of the University of Michigan and a lot of large employers. In fact, it's on the basis of, of the experience of these employers that we have a pretty good sense of, of how these exchanges work. And, and I think the research shows that when consumers are faced with uh, a menu of plans that, that provides apples to apples comparisons, clear information about price and quality, that people will, will choose on the basis of price um, and, and uh, you know, migrate to those plans that offer better value and switch plans when premiums change. Um, and this has the potential to, to, be, uh, uh, to encourage price competition among insurers um, and be something that can constrain the, the growth of healthcare costs. Now, um, the, the, the Senate and the House bill were very similar in lots of respects. One area where they differed was that in the House version of the exchanges, there was a national exchange. Um, in the Senate, there are, are state level exchanges. And so there, there are trade offs between these two models. Um, I think you know, the, a, a larger exchange, exchange is going to mean more, uh, greater potential for economies of scale, but perhaps a state level exchange is going to allow policymakers to, to tailor uh, the organization to, the, to the, the specifics of the state. Um, in thinking about how the exchange is implemented, uh, I, I should say also, one of the things that's key about the exchange is that the rules uh, within the exchange are going to be very similar to what they are in a large employer sponsor group. So insurance companies will not be allowed to uh, deny coverage based on health risk. They're not going to be allowed to drop your coverage when your health risk changes. There'll be limits on how much um, they can exclude pre-existing conditions. Um, and there's going to be limits uh, in the extent to which premiums can vary with health risk. And, and, and so um, the hope is that because consumers will have these apples to apples comparisons, they'll choose on the basis of price. And because insurers will not be able to, to deny people or, or will be less able to compete on risk selection, um, that will also encourage price competition. I think one of the, the, the key policy design features that that could vary across states, and I think it's, it's worth looking at as states implement these things, is how active an agent the, the exchange will be. So I think the way that, that most proponents of the managed competition model picture it is that the exchange uh, is a very active negotiator with the health plans. Okay, so, so the exchange is going to take bids from the health plans in terms of what the premium is going to be, what the benefits are, and then go back to the plans if they think the premiums are too high, and, and, and basically, uh, force the, the, the health plans to compete to be on the menu in the first place. And then once they're on the menu, there will be competition among those, those plans. Um, and so the idea is with that, that active role of, of the exchange, uh, you're, you're serving a vetting purpose, you're limiting the number of choices which should make the, the decision making easier for, for consumers, um, and you know, I think the, the thought is that that's going to be more effective as, as a way to, to uh, deliver value. The other extreme would be sort of to be the travelocity of, of health insurance. Basically to say that the exchange is open to any uh, insurer that can meet minimum standards and um, the exchange would be very passive. And this is more along the lines of what the, the Medicare program does with the, the prescription drug plan, uh, Medicare Part D. And so you could end up with a situation where there's a huge number of plans and um, you know, it doesn't really take much to be on the, the menu and then um, uh, competition takes place within that menu. Um, the argument against this, I think, is, is that it can lead to information overload and, and it, could be, it could complicate the choice decision for, uh, for consumers um, and, and you lose the ability to, to sort of control costs at that, at that upper level of competition. Um, Marianne's going to talk about more about the details of how these insurance uh, market regulations work. Um, that's actually a very significant change and, and that combined with the uh, individual mandate um, could have the potential to really clean up the market. Um, and I think Joe is probably going to talk more about uh, what the, the reimbursement issue for providers means on the provider side um, and on the policy side. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to both of them.
Well, I'm, I'm totally with Tom. It's an incredibly exciting time for those of us who are healthcare junkies, um, whether you like this bill or you don't like this bill. But I have to say, I stayed up way too late last night <laughs> watching all of this exchange uh, because it was just fascinating. And you know, as we all heard in that dialogue, uh, this is one of the biggest changes uh, we have seen, certainly. Uh, in our lifetimes, in, and particularly in, in healthcare. So it's a really wonderful day to be here, to have a chance to talk with all of you about what this legislation could mean, uh, and a little bit to reflect back on why we need it. And, and that's part of the, the piece that, that I want to talk about, sort of building on uh, some of the pieces that, that Tom spoke about. Uh, before I, I launch, and, and you know, Matt asked me to talk in particular from the perspective of the private insurers. And so you know, I think, that the private insurers were totally the bad guys in this dialogue. It's what got everybody focused on what the need for health care reform is. So I always sort of feel badly when I'm up here sort of being the spokesperson for the private insurers. But you have to say and, uh, that we would not be here today talking about the fact that we have health care reform had it not been for the private insurers. And in particular, I think we owe great thanks to Anthem Blue Cross in California because if it had not been for their very well-timed <laughs> announcement of their 39% rate increase in the individual market, we would definitely not be here today talking about the passage of health care reform last night. I truly believe, and Joe can speak to this from his years in politics, that policy is often, often turns on that one very significant symbolic thing that happens that makes everybody think about something a little bit differently. We thought that happened when Scott Brown got elected on January 19th, oh, <coughs> eons ago in our political history. Um, but in fact, I think it happened when Anthem announced its rate increase because it both got everybody focused on what was at issue and frankly, it gave the Democrats a very clear talking point that people could understand about why it is we need health care reform. And so let me talk with you just a little bit about what the private market looks like. And again, I'm going to talk some more about why we need uh, health insurance reform, because that's really my angle on it. And then just briefly uh, cover, uh, in addition to Tom's points, uh, what the bill will do, you know, in many ways very quickly in the private market, and in some pieces a little bit further out there. So let's start by taking a look for a minute uh, at the private health insurance market. Um, private health insurance, about 67% of U.S. population is covered by private health insurance. Most, as Tom said, through employer-provided coverage, but quite a few actually through the individual market where they purchase it themselves. And, and that ranges, just like the uninsured numbers range, it ranges by state. I think the lowest uh, in the country is New Mexico at about 54%, uh, the highest uh, at least in 2007, 2008. Highest was New Hampshire uh, at about 79%. Michigan ranks 13th uh, in, at 74% in terms of the percentage of our state's population uh, covered by private health insurance. And that is very much the legacy, as Tom mentioned, of the strength of labor uh, in our state uh, who made health insurance really a premier bargaining a component of their benefit packages really from the 1940s on. It's only until this most recent period of time uh, where we've seen benefits being cut actually for those represented by organized labor. And so it's been a very important part of our history uh, and the reason why we have a very high rate of private health coverage here in Michigan. But despite that fact, and certainly nationally and in Michigan, we've seen lots of people both losing coverage and also having to pay more for the coverage that they have. And so just looking at Michigan since 2007, 11% of employers have dropped private health coverage. Now that's in part because what we've seen to the extent we've had any growth in the economic activity in our state, it's been mostly in the small business sector. And as Tom said, that's the sector of our economy that tends to offer much less frequently, offer health insurance much less frequently than do large uh, employers. And so more and more employers in the state of Michigan are not providing a health coverage. And the picture is looking different than it looked historically. So people in our state and in every state are losing coverage because employers have been dropping that coverage. 
But even people with private coverage have been facing enormous challenges in getting access to care, even though they have coverage. Tom gave you the statistic on those with Medicaid. They've got coverage, uh, but they can't find a provider who will take that coverage. And I know Joe's going to talk about that from firsthand experience in, in much more detail. So let me talk a little bit about those um, with private health insurance coverage. In, in the same survey where we had the 35% finding on Medicaid, we found that 17% of those with private health coverage said they had delayed needed care because they couldn't afford it. And I think you've had that personal experience. And it's because what we've seen, and I'm sure all of you in this room have had this experience, is that copays and deductibles have increased significantly. People's premium sharing, where they're paying a portion of the premium, has increased. And so people, even with coverage, are delaying care that they need because they can't afford their deductible. In Michigan, in just two years, between 2006 and 2008, deductibles increased 38%. Now, we're still lower than the US average, and that's, again, that legacy of labor who was always violently opposed, frankly, to co-pays uh, and deductibles. But it's a 38% increase uh, in deductibles in a two-year period. And so people even here are delaying care uh, because they don't, uh, can't afford that deductible. And some people, even though they are offered health coverage by their employer, can't afford to pay their share of that coverage. On average, in Michigan, for a family plan, costs about 11000 and change, 11300 I believe, for family coverage. And people in Michigan pay for family coverage, on average, about 10% of that uh, cost. And there are a lot of people who can't afford that component of their cost. And so, again, more people are losing coverage, uh, and even those with coverage are having a difficulty getting the care that they need. Now, I want to spend a little more time on the individual market. And I'm not actually going to talk about Anthem's 39% rate increase, because I don't know enough about the specifics in that market. I want to talk instead for a minute about Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Michigan and their requested 56% rate increase in the individual market. And some of you who've been following healthcare might have seen uh, those two uh, compared uh, in the run-up to healthcare reform and, and some of the uh, politicians using Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Michigan as another state that's an example of the problem uh, of unjustified rate increases. But I would say to you that, in fact, what happened in Michigan is a different issue, very different issue than what happened in California, and really an example of how broken the individual market has been. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Michigan is unique in the state and really now unique in the country in that it is required and has always been required by state statute to take all comers regardless of health status. They cannot what's called medically underwrite. Uh, they cannot exclude people based upon their health status. And they have very strict limits on the pre-existing condition uh, waiting periods that they can apply in for the non-group market. Their individual rates are regulated by the state insurance commissioner, and so they have to get approval to have their rates approved. Those requirements do not apply to any other commercial insurer in our state, and I don't think nationally anymore. Uh, and they apply in a much more limited way to HMO programs in our state. So nobody has the same kind of responsibility to be the payer of last resort in the state that Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Michigan does. And it does for many reasons good reasons. It's a nonprofit. Uh, it has tax breaks from the state. The uh, state feels very strongly that it needs to provide subsidies as a result of those tax breaks. And I don't have time to go into the, the total numbers to see whether how those balance out. But I would still say to you that this is a unique market. And we need to look at it in that way. What's happened as a result of the unique approach and the fact that Blue Cross of Michigan is the only payer with these requirements is that over time, only certain people have bought their individual health coverage from Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Frankly, they're the sick or the ones who think that they're going to use health coverage in the future. If you're healthy, if you're young, you can get your health coverage much cheaper elsewhere. And so what's happened is that over the years, 
people who are healthy and young have moved away from Blue Cross and Blue Shield, leaving behind the sick and the older segment of the population, and have created what is called an actuarial uh, rate spiral, spiral uh, in that segment, adverse selection, in that segment of the business for Blue Cross and Blue Shield. So their request for a 56% rate increase, which they didn't get, I think they got 24% or something like that in the end, um, because there's politics involved with that too, but their request for the 56% rate increase really had to do with the fact that they were reflecting that the individual market has broken down in our state. They are an example of why we need health care reform, of why we need the individual mandates that health care reform requires, of why everybody has to be in the system. Because insurance operates on a very simple principle. It's a sharing of the risk and a pooling of the cost. And if you only have people in your pool who are going to use your services, then you have nobody to share the cost with. And eventually, you have no insurance. And that's what we really saw here in Michigan. And so what came through in this health care reform bill is a way to address that breakdown, particularly in the individual market. And there's some technical components to it, as, as Tom said, in terms of getting your coverage through the health insurance exchanges. And there's a lot of requirements on those exchanges. But essentially, going forward, every insurer in this country will look closer to Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Michigan than the other insurers that are out there today. And in fact, that's going to happen pretty quickly. So almost immediately, insurers are prohibited from rescission. That's the practice of going in and taking back your coverage because you got sick. Gee, what a surprise. You have coverage to get cover you when you're sick. Um, and that will be eliminated almost immediately. There is a limit almost immediately uh, in effect in the bill. Uh, are uh, is an elimination of lifetime limits on coverage. Again, I didn't talk about this because it's not so much a problem in Michigan, but it's very much a problem in other states where people have coverage, but it has a fixed dollar amount of how much that coverage will pay in a lifetime. And I've had, and you've probably had experiences of being on the phone with people who have hemophilia or heartbreaking diseases, and they've exhausted their health coverage and they didn't even know it. They thought they had good coverage and they did not know it. And so that goes away almost immediately uh, in these bills. Uh, there are limits uh, on pre-existing conditions almost immediately, exclusions for children, um, no longer than six months. And for everybody else, uh, those provisions will go into place um, by 2014. And so you're going to see a huge change in the marketplace in the approach to health insurance coverage. Now, in return for that, and the complaint that you heard from the insurance industry on this bill, is the insurance industry wanted all of these things, and yes, their market's going to grow and it's going to be good for their business, and Matt has some comments on that, and they, they, it, that's true. The insurance industry's concern is that the penalties for not purchasing health insurance coverage are actually pretty low. Um, for an individual, six, it grows to, it starts much lower, but it grows to $695. I told you, 11000 is what insurance costs. And yes, there's lots of subsidies. It's very complicated to figure out what will really happen in the market. It is a big bill, and it's very complicated to, lots of moving parts to figure out what will happen. But the concern is that the healthy, the young, many of you uh, will choose to pay the penalty in your taxes rather than actually go out and get the coverage, even with the subsidies that you get. So that's something we're going to have to see over time. Market's going to change. It's very exciting. And I think it's a great thing. Very exciting. OK. And I'll turn it over to Joe. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, uh, I, I lecture in this room sometimes. And the sweet spot is right down there where you can stand and be heard. But uh, I've been told by the powers that be that if we step away from the microphone in this, penalty will be uh, punishment will be swift and sure, so I, uh, I will not step away from the microphone. I, uh, I always kind of laugh when someone tells me, you're going to have to give a talk at 4.30 or 5 in the afternoon. Uh, it's not as bad as giving a talk at 7.30 or 8 at night after an hour's worth of cocktail hour. 
Uh, but nevertheless, uh, you do get the impression sometimes that you're talking to the Society for the Study of Sleep Disorders when you uh, are talking at uh, this hour of the day. I will try, however, not to uh, be a soporific to all of you and to uh, interest you in some of the political issues uh, that we're dealing with. It will involve lowering the, lowering the level of discourse a little bit of what you've been hearing, but nevertheless, uh, that's the way these things happen. I was, I was uh, in my mind yesterday trying to imagine the atmosphere in Congress uh, over the last week, and especially the weekend. Uh, as you know, members of Congress like to get out of Dodge uh, on Friday morning, some uh, on, uh, on Thursday evening. I never did that because I didn't want to get trampled by my own colleagues at the airport trying to get an airplane <laughs> getting out of town, so I used to leave on Friday morning. But uh, Congress in town uh, over a weekend is a rarity, a true rarity, as was uh, la last weekend. Now, on the Democrat side, uh, I can well imagine uh, what the freshman and perhaps sophomore members of the Democrat caucus were going through as they tried to line up uh, the votes. Uh, I have a feeling that, uh, that uh, uh, Mr. Clyborne, the whip, and uh, his assistants uh, may have literally been using a whip on some, on some freshmen. Because some freshman uh, Democrats who voted yes uh, yesterday literally put their seats uh, at great risk. There is utterly no question that they did that. Uh, I give them a lot of credit for courage in making that vote. Uh, I can tell you uh, that they were leaned on very heavily. They were leaned on heavily to the point of saying we're going to take you off one committee and put you on a lesser committee. They were leaned on to the point of, of uh, uh, Democratic poobah saying uh, don't expect quite as much money in your campaign this year. Uh, the pressure was tremendous. If you think that is not true, I would like to introduce you to my friend the Tooth Fairy. It is true. Uh, on the Republican side, it may have been worse. Uh, having been on the Republican side and uh, uh, you know, really, really cast out as an apostate uh, because I was a moderate Republican, uh, the Republican side was worse. Uh, what is done uh, in the Republican caucus is equal to what the Democrats did, uh, but worse. Uh, and I noticed that. Uh, there was not one Republican yes vote. Uh, I am not surprised at that, uh, but if you're threatened with sudden and horrible death, you <laughs> apparently will vote the way they want you to vote. And, and that's what happened. 34 Democrats voted no. 34 Democrats voted no. I tried to, to uh, compare that list with the list of Democrats who are retiring, and, and interesting, interestingly enough, there's not much of a comparison. Uh, a couple who are retiring voted no. But what I did find is that 21 of the 34 were from the South. Uh, very few were from the uh, North and Northeast. There was a New, there was a New Jerseyite, a New Yorker. Uh, there was uh, one from Illinois, one from Massachusetts, which surprised me a great deal. Uh, but Democrats pretty well uh, hung together, and I will tell you, I believe that each and every Democrat who voted no got a mother may I to do so. And these would be people who would be in very, very difficult uh, re-election campaigns next year. And I can also assure you uh, that the whip on the, on the D side counted to 216 uh, before he let anybody say they were going to vote no. Uh, and uh, so it happened. There are four vacancies now. That's why it was, it was 216. I was disappointed in the physicians in Congress, and there are now eight or nine physicians in Congress, because they were not out there in front uh, in the debate. I have been disappointed, especially in the Republican physicians, uh, numbers of whom I served with in my days in Congress, uh, because they did not seem to be and weren't, again, interested 
uh, in health care, anything else but health care. Some of the real hardcore, I will use the word conservative, it is an acceptable political term. I would use another word. We're out having a couple of beers with somebody. <laughs> Some of the hardcore conservatives, uh, physicians don't, for some reason, uh, espouse any change in health care in the Congress. Many of them also are from the South. As, as an example, the, the Georgia delegation, which I believe is 14 or 15, has three physicians in it. They are all three hardcore to the right, and I'm disappointed that the physicians uh, in Congress uh, did not uh, take a greater part in the debate. I think they could have added something to the debate had they desired to on both sides of the aisle, and they didn't do it. So without a single Republican vote, which is historic, without a single Republican vote, a, uh, a milepost piece of legislation passed the U.S. House, and at least part of it has gone to the President. But even the, the Lyndon Johnson programs of the 1960s, uh, when they went through, the Great Society programs went through, there were Republican votes, significant numbers. Now, what does that tell you? It tells you that the polarity in Washington uh, has become terrible. Uh, I can tell you that from personal experience. The Republicans and the Democrats are at antipodes with each other. And uh, until that changes, uh, things are not going to get a lot better uh, in the Congress. There are numbers of retirements this year, and I'm hopeful that the people who come in and replace those retiring or running for the Senate or running for governor of their state will have a better opportunity uh, to get to know each other and to be more productive. It doesn't work if you don't talk to the guy on the other side of the aisle. It doesn't work. Uh, this was a great example of that, and I have to give President Obama a great deal of credit for his perseverance in this because he stuck with it and stuck with it and stuck with it and stuck with it. I have no idea what he voted, what, what, he, what he offered some of the members of the Democrat side uh, for their vote. I think they're going to find some nice things in their district, uh, but he did persevere, and I give him a tremendous uh, amount of, of credit for that. In the state of Michigan, uh, we are going to see what happens now that the, the uh, result of the, of the bill that passed yesterday flows downhill, and let's we see what happens in each state. We have a situation in our legislature where, first, they almost never talk about health care issues. And I might add that when I was in the Congress, they almost never talked about health care issues as well, which was a surprise to me. Uh, but in our legislature, they don't. There's a health policy committee in both houses. Uh, they deal with issues uh, that sometimes y you say, why are they dealing with this issue? This really has not much to do with the general health care uh, in the United States. The Senate Health Policy uh, Committee in the Michigan uh, legislature now is uh, dealing with trying to eviscerate the embryonic stem cell uh, constitutional amendment which passed uh, in, in November 2008. And they're spending virtually all their time on this. So it is, one wonders why. There is not a lot of knowledge about health care uh, in people who have never been in a health care profession uh, or followed it very closely. Uh, this is why Congress is the way it is. This is why our legislature is the way it is. There are 1.8 million people in Michigan on Medicaid. Uh, there are going to be more, several hundred thousand more with this bill. Adults, people over 21, uh, and I believe that's a good thing. Uh, Medicaid, the state cost for Medicaid in Michigan, is now over $3 billion a year. It is the biggest item in the general fund budget, larger than corrections, which is about $2.9 billion, excuse me, $1.9 billion, and larger than the university budget, which is now about $1.65 billion. Uh, 
It wasn't when I was in the legislature, but it is now. These are going to be huge, huge issues for our legislature to deal with. What services are they going to offer uh, when you have several hundred thousand new adults uh, coming on, onto the Medicaid rolls? We cut out hearing, we cut out chiropractic, we cut out podiatric, uh, we cut out vision, we cut out dental, which was a mistake. So what services are going to be are going to be uh, are, are given and and I believe that uh, we have to look at at least a couple of those put them back dental especially dental uh, hearing and vision perhaps uh, but our legislature has big decisions to make and I don't know if there is the will uh, to make them I hope that there is the former assistant secretary of, Fe of defense for health who is a professor at the University of Texas now, uh, said that he felt that Congress would be better off if they did this, and this is what he said people really wanted. They want exchanges, purchasing pools, administrative simplification, malpractice reform, efforts to reduce errors, waste, and fraud, and no federal funding for elective abortions. Many are okay with expanding Medicaid and CHIP, but most do not want any increased taxes or deficits. About 40% would pay a few hundred dollars a year if that would cover all of the uninsured. And 50% are okay with higher taxes on million dollar incomes and on cigarettes. The others want the uninsured to be covered by savings that could be generated by reducing fraud, errors, waste, and defensive medicine. That horse is out of the barn right now. I'm not sure where it's gonna go, but I would guess that there will be a drawback to something similar to that when all this is put to bed and we find out what part of the bill that passed uh, is effective. I agree with the near universal coverage that we have now and one of my credos politically has always been universal access to health care. I agree with the insurance reforms. I agree that uh, this is a start at cost control. I agree that no one should be exempted because of pre-existing conditions. And I agree that this does help the individual market and God knows that we need it. What I don't know and I think what all of us really don't know is where we're gonna be five years or eight years or 10 years down the line. I, I would suggest uh, that you elect to the Congress and to the legislature people who are conversant with healthcare, with healthcare economics, and with providing the best possible health care uh, to Americans. If we don't do that, uh, the spirit of this bill won't be fulfilled. By and large, it's a good bill. There's too much in it. I probably, and you're going to ask me this, I will tell you, I probably would have voted no, but I probably would have come right back the next day and said, here's the parts of this bill that are really good. Can't we do this? Uh, there probably is going to be a little of that going on in the Senate now as well. We'll just see what happens. Thanks very much. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for a great beginning to our discussion this afternoon. They've really given you a wide set of ideas to chew on and uh, opinions to think about. So I'll now open up the floor to questions. Uh, please raise your hand and uh, I'll call on you. Please speak loudly and I will rephrase the question for purposes of our video today. We'll start with Professor Dick right here in front. Uh, right. I, uh, I was curious to kind of know more about what are some of the specific kind of details, legislative decisions at the state level that are going to be key um, and, and this I think kind of the point that Tom raised about how active versus passive the exchanges will be could be one. I'm not familiar with this area. I imagine there's a few things that the state could or couldn't do that would completely change in practice the effect of the legislation in the state. The question is, what are the key decisions at the state level that 
people in Michigan are going to need to make, or people in other states are going to need to make, that may strongly affect the way in which the federal legislation is going to play out at the state level. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, you mentioned the one is, is what are these exchanges going to look like and, and um, how active they're going to be in, in sort of managing the competition. Um, it's not even clear that these will be at the state level. They could possibly be at the sub-state level, which is sort of hard to imagine. That, that seems like uh, not a very good way to achieve economies of scale. Um, I don't know. I mean, one, one of the areas, that, the big areas where the House and the Senate bill differed was the, um, the House bill had the public option and the Senate bill doesn't. I don't know what the potential is for some, something like a public option to, to reemerge. Well, there, there is a co-op that got inserted in the bill that actually can be put into effect almost immediately. And that was what some people suggested could be an alternative to the public option. It's, I, I will be amazed if any state actually does this because what it is is a member-run health plan. We've had member-run health plans, Group Health of Puget Sound, uh, Kaiser to some degree, right? Um, we've had a few. Uh, I really just don't see that they'll be able to compete. And so, but that could be put in place pretty quickly. Texas had a co-op and it went broke. Yeah, so. So, uh, it, it, was it a, did my heart good that something went broke in Texas, but the Texas <laughs> co-op went broke. Are, are there other key decisions besides uh, issues regarding the exchange? There are decisions. You know, as Joe said, the, uh, in terms of Medicaid expansion, they, do, they will require essential benefits to be covered, uh, but there will be some decisions around what else is covered. Uh, the exchanges um, can be either a nonprofit or a state-run entity, and so there'll have to be a decision. And we were talking beforehand about the fact that we're in a, in a governor change uh, timeline here in Michigan, and who's going to actually make that decision? You know, it's going to be, we're going to be behind the curve here because it probably won't be this governor who decides whether it's going to be public. So there's, a, there's quite a bit, actually. I think there's also transition issues as you move from the current non-group market, which is regulated in very different ways across different states, to putting people into the, into the exchanges. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, the, the underwriting regulations go into effect right away, but the exchanges won't be up for a couple of years. And so, um, there's talk about high-risk pools as, as a temporary mechanism to provide coverage for people who are uninsurable. Um, the, state exper the experiences of different states with high-risk pools has not been very positive. They tend to be underfunded and, and uh, still very expensive for enrollees. So um, I, I'm not sure it's clear how exactly that's going to play out. And, and as I said, different states will be farther along the curve than others. And in, and in Michigan, this issue of the high-risk pool is going to be very interesting because the high-risk pool goes into effect almost immediately. It goes into effect, I think, within 90 days of when the president signs. How it goes into effect is very unclear. And as Joe said, the, even the Michigan legislature has been in discussion about insurance reform because of this issue of the, the risk spiral for Blue Cross here in Michigan. Uh, and so how they... and, and Payers have been arguing for a high-risk pool, but whether it looks like exactly what was intended by Congress is not clear yet. Another question over here? Yeah, I have a question. Under the current system, if you do not have insurance, let's say you're unemployed and you have an appendicitis and you go into the hospital and spend four days, you get a bill for ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000. And the hospital then dumbs you for that bill or makes a payment arrangement or whatever. If you have insurance through Blue Cross, you go into the hospital, and they submit a bill for $10,000 to Blue Cross, and Blue Cross says, well, we approve $2,000. I think 20% is probably a pretty good estimate on that. That's a little low. <laughs> but the, the point is okay. <laughs> so if you're wealthy enough or well enough, enough off to have insurance, you're, the hospital, you're paying less. So I have two questions. One is, in this first case of this person, who is really poor, but not poor enough, how long will it take before that person is free of that debt? And number two is once these exchanges go into place, are there going to be any requirements for the insurance companies to pay the same amount? Well, if you go and buy the lowest price will, from a company, will you suddenly find out that your doctor or hospital won't accept that? So the question is a multi-part question uh, that asks us to distinguish between how a hospital works with an uninsured patient versus an insured patient and whether under the exchanges 
plans will be held to the same agreements with health care providers. Okay, you go ahead and take that one. Uh, so, first of all, a couple things. You know, that issue of the uh, hospitals charging more to the uninsured got a lot of attention a few years back. And there actually have been some legislative changes to, uh, and pressure, <laughs> informal pressure, to require hospitals to charge less to the uninsured than they have. Nevertheless, your, your point is correct. Unfortunately, there's nothing in the bill that standardizes payments from health plans to providers. There is, however, within the exchanges, the, uh, in, the expectation and, in fact, probably will be regulations that require insurance commissioners to oversee the rates that are charged by health plans. And they require a, uh, what's called a medical loss ratio, a certain percentage of the dollars have to be spent for medical care, not for profits and administration. For large groups, it's 85%, for small, it's 80%. Uh, and so there'll be some regulation on those lines, but not on standardization of price. That is definitely something that did not get included. Uh, and so we'll see over time. I don't know the answer to your question about how long it will take some, for somebody to work out that debt. It's a huge problem for the uninsured. Now, of course, I think Tom said this bill will cover, I mean, the, the expectation is, the estimate is it will cover 91, 94% of the population. So we'll have many fewer uninsured in the future. Oh, that's, that's, that's a question that, you know, when Joe said there are a lot of moving parts, that's a question we were talking about earlier. It's a, it's a little unclear. They'll be getting pay, we, we think it'll lower uh, uncompensated care, because they'll be getting payments from people who are currently not paying at all, uh, but they'll be getting more Medicaid payments, which are very low. And so how that washes out, we don't know. I'll take a question in the center and then get the ink scarf. Yep. Thanks, <laughs> um, Sorry, I couldn't see the gentleman behind the camera. Go ahead. The two um, of you next. Okay, uh, two questions. One, why is there a tendency to use um, access and coverage interchangeably, especially since there are very different things, especially for people um, that are in impoverished areas or rural areas? And then also, um, how do you see the poverty level, because they're so archaic, how do you see that affecting people's ability to get insurance bills? Two very good questions. The first is distinguishing between the terms access and coverage and why those two are often used interchangeably, especially by those in politics and perhaps by us here today. Um, and then uh, the question is, why use this poverty level metric when we know it's not only archaic, but perhaps uh, misleading in terms of the overall burden on families? I'll take the first part of that, and having to do with access. And it's something I've felt very strongly about for years and years and years. And that is that there should be, you can describe it any way you want, I say universal access, call it whatever you want. Which means that everybody should have a door to walk into to get primary care and know where that door is. And it's not the emergency room door at 3 in the morning. Uh, and that is one of the reasons I'm a very strong advocate for federally qualified health centers, FQHCs. A program uh, first advocated in Lyndon Johnson's War on Poverty and has been supported by every president, Republican or Democrat, since then, including George W. Bush, who increased the numbers of FQHCs from 1,100 to over 1,300. Uh, this is not a partisan issue. The concept works. FQHCs are locally organized 501c3s that follow certain government regulations, uh, and they, they do get significant subsidies for just those self-same people who did not have access before. There are about 30 of them in Michigan. They do very well. Uh, why am I strongly in favor of them? I work in one of them, and I know they work. And I see people with Blue Cross. I see people with commercial insurance. I see people on Medicare. I see people on Medicaid, and I see the people with nothing who would have no access. But on the basis of income, according to federal law, they are given a 25, 50, 75, or 100 percent sliding fee discount. So anybody that comes to the FQHC, any FQHC, does have access. And that concept should be enlarged, and instead of 1,300 of those in the United States, maybe 13,000 of them would be better. There are 50 of them in Chicago 
doing very well. Fortunately, there are only three in Detroit. There should be a lot more in Detroit. But it's an idea not whose time has come because they've been around a long time, but it's an idea that people should espouse, wrap their arms around, and we should increase those numbers for access. And, and there is $11 billion in this bill yep. to expand uh, community health centers and the National Service Corps over five years. There's another question about why continue to pay these uh, policies to the federal poverty level. Tom, did you have some questions? Oh, I, I, I think that everyone knows the federal poverty level is sort of a flawed measure, but it's the one we have, and so it's, it's convenient. Um, I think one of the things about, about this bill is that currently states implement these, these income thresholds in very different ways in terms of what income they count and what income they, they disregard. And so two states on paper could have what looks like the same uh, income eligibility threshold, but they're actually quite different in practice the way they determine what's counted. And I, I think there's going to be a standardization there so that um, you know, whatever the income threshold is, it's probably going to be effectively somewhat higher when, when you account for disregards. Yes, sir. The, uh, the reconciliation bill tries to correct the Medicaid uh, disparity in how physicians will be uh, reimbursed. Mm -hmm. uh, it calls for them to be reimbursed at uh, the level, at the Medicaid, Medicare level instead of the Medicaid level, and the federal government to pay for those. So my question is, how will that work out in Michigan? That's part one. Part two is there are a set of people who are have their income is above four hundred percent of poverty, but they cannot pay the premium costs and the copays. Are they allowed into the catastrophic plans by the new bill? So there are two questions. One is referring to the reconciliation bill, which attempts to address some of the Medicaid reimbursement disparity we've been talking about here today by specifying that primary care providers under Medicaid should be reimbursed at higher Medicare levels. The question is, how would that play out in Michigan? In other words, what might the effect be? Number two is, for a well-off individual earning more than 400% of <coughs> poverty, how would they be eligible for plans in the health care reform package going forward? So I'll do the Medicare one, I and then in the, you do the other one. Okay, the, on, so on the Medicaid one, and I do want to clarify, Max, that it, it is not all uh, payments to Medicaid providers. It is, as Matt said, it's just primary care um, payments that get equalized to Medicare, which is a great thing, and it's a start. We need to do more than that because uh, as Tom said we have a really serious access problem when it comes to Medicaid because providers, because they pay so little. Uh, it's 100% funded by the federal, that piece of it is 100% funded by the federal government, and so it's no cost to Michigan. So I don't think that piece, at least for now, it's a little bit unclear what happens uh, in 2019. You know, the other piece that is 100% funded by the federal government until 2019 is the Medicaid expansion. So for the people who are uh, at 133 percent or less of poverty, the 500,000 or so in Michigan who are at 133 percent of poverty and less but not currently covered, that's also 100 percent federally funded, but till 2019 when it, when it shifts to 90 percent. And it's a little unclear what will happen to that primary care Medicare payment in 2019. The second part. So I think that um, people who are uninsured and have family incomes above 400 percent of poverty represent about 10% of, of the 46 million people who are uninsured. So it's a relatively small part of the, the uninsured population. And I think it's, it's a mix of people who either are, you can think of them uninsured by choice, I mean, they're, they're sort of taking their chances, or um, are unable to get coverage because uh, they're not an employer group and they're considered high risk <laughs> by non-group insurers. So all of these people will be subject to the mandate. They'll have to go out and buy coverage. Um, they won't get uh, income-based subsidies, so they'll have to pay the full premium themselves. But to the extent that they were excluded because they're high risk, they will benefit from the new consumer protections and they will be able to buy insurance through the exchanges. So if, if you're somebody in that category and you just, you know, you're young invincible and deciding not to, to get coverage, this is going to be a new requirement, and then the question is whether the, the stick of the penalty is enough to get you covered. Um, if you're somebody that's been sort of priced out of the market or, or excluded because of medical underwriting, 
then this will be a real improvement. Yeah, and the, ex the exchanges have uh, five benefit packages, bronze, silver, gold, platinum, and the catastrophic. And I, the catastrophic was designed for the young invincibles. And I think it has an, I think it has an age limit in it, if I remember correctly. 26, right? maybe? Yeah. Or 29, maybe. So it depends. Or three or um, bidding into um, 5,000 A, five, one, 5,000 A through five of the new bill. I yeah. can't find those, so I'm wondering who's in there. <laughs> we, will, we, will, we will know when we pages. see the regulations, the thousands of pages. These are hardship pages. Yeah. Uh, there, there are some hardship uh, you know, subsidies beyond the other subsidies that are in the bill. So we're going to have to see how that plays out. Can you start again? Right here? No, just behind. Hi. Um, as a prospective medical school student and physician, how do you expect this bill will affect the way like, students choose their specialties in the medical field and in the future um, due to the changes in the way medical like, doctors are going to be compensated and reimbursed? The question is for individuals considering uh, medical hey, school or career in medical good. professions, how do we think this health care reform bill is going to affect decision making for those individuals? You can only conjecture on that. I'll tell you what I think, and I could be dead wrong. I think it is, for all the good things, uh, I think it is going to further depress the numbers of people who go into family practice. I think that's going to happen, and that's unfortunate. Uh, family practice, general internal medicine, general pediatrics, I think those numbers will continue to go down, and they're now only 2% of medical school graduates. Uh, uh, anyhow, so I think those numbers will go down. Uh, I think that physicians will look at the various specialties and there will be some picking and choosing done uh, as to what specialty to go into uh, because of reimbursement levels. I, I can't believe that won't happen. It's human nature. Uh, but I, I, I can't see it enhancing numbers of people going into family practice, which is where we really need people. I think it will continue to depress the, the numbers of people going to family practice. If I could just add something there. There's, there are some incentives written in the bill to encourage people to go into primary care by incentivizing primary care itself. Mm -hmm. But there is nothing done about actual residency training positions for primary care. So you've got, in other words, a narrowing of your pipeline before the actual area you're trying to incentivize which won't really add up unless there's other legislation to expand the pipeline. Other questions? So in the U.S., there's often tensions between federal versus state authority for intervening. And I'm wondering if any of you uh, are worried about any legal challenges to any part of the giant uh, health care reform bill. And in particular, there's rumblings out there about that the, mm -hmm. the private health insurance mandate is actually the federal government doesn't have a legal authority to issue that, whereas states could, like Massachusetts. Interestingly okay. enough, some states have had constitutional amendments uh, offered in their legislatures, and there's one written in Michigan. It hasn't been offered yet, and I hope it won't be, but it's been written, which basically goes back to Andrew Jackson versus John C. Calhoun and nullification. The, the, states, can, the states don't have to accept uh, what the federal government uh, mandates upon them, uh, even though that mandate is a legal mandate. I believe at some point uh, that will end up in the courts. I hope it doesn't, but I think it probably will, because some states will persist in this. But we've seen this before, and it, it's, it's, it's a return to the, to, the, uh, to the doctrine of nullification out of the 1820s and 1830s, which I find mind-boggling. Uh, I was just going to say, <coughs> great not to be an attorney and answer your question for an attorney, but I have seen a lot of attorney analysis on that point, and most of the attorneys that I've seen have said uh, that, that the state bans are not going to work here because really the way this is going to be implemented is a tax code change, and it will not be prevented by, because it's not really, a, we talk about it as a mandate, that's a little bit, it's kind of like access versus coverage. We, it's a slip of the tongue, really, it's not mandating so much as it is applying tax penalties, and the federal government has the ability to tax. I hope you're right. Based on Tim Jones. Yeah. 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 DMC. Pardon? The DMC. Yeah. Good question. Good question. Yeah. This, the question <laughs> is. Uh, 
is one that is relevant to the health care reform debate, although obviously not played out in the halls of Washington, which is you probably heard news that a national for-profit hospital chain has purchased Detroit Medical Center. And the question put to the panel is, what makes a for-profit business think it can run a profitable medical center in Detroit? And perhaps, could reform help them do so? I was adamant. I, I mean, I'd say something about it. But yeah, so, I, well, I'll tell you what I told the yeah, yeah. cranes today, which is that you know the way for profits are very clear. I mean, they are responsive to their shareholders. There's a lot of research out there that says for profits do not provide the same community benefit that nonprofits do, uh, and the way they make money is to not cover people or not provide services to people who can't pay. So to the extent, so I, what I'm concerned about for Detroit is to the extent that we have a for-profit moving into the city. And I know why DMC wants Vanguard, uh, because they do need capital infusion. It's, it's really a challenge. Uh, I think we've got to watch as a community to see whether DMC in Detroit receiving, which is the insurer of last resort, the safety net, which is still <laughs> going to be needed for quite some time, uh, is is still going to serve that population. And, and will health care reform help them? Uh, yes, because it will reduce the number of uninsured. But again, Medicaid is a very low payer. And to the extent we're covering, as Tom said, half the population that gets coverage are going to get it through Medicaid. Uh, that is not a profit center for any hospital. I can tell you that. So I, I'm very concerned. There are some in this room who are old enough to remember uh, about 20 years ago, a little less perhaps, uh, when there was a movement to sell the University of Michigan Medical Center to a private entity. Uh, University of West Virginia had already done it. There's a couple of others, but West Virginia is the one that sticks in my mind. Now, I have criticized the legislature to a fare thee well today, but now I'll say something good about the legislature and about a governor who was not particularly popular in Ann Arbor. Because that governor and myself came to Ann Arbor when that idea was, was mooted, uh, and we spoke to the people in charge, up to the big guy in charge, and said, not only no, but hell no. You cannot do that. Uh, our attorneys say you can't do it without a constitutional amendment. You say you can, but it is not a good idea because the people of the state of Michigan, if there's one thing they wrap their arms around and hold as their own, it is the University of Michigan Medical Center. And fortunately, uh, the people here in Ann Arbor who thought the idea was a good idea uh, for a short period of time backed off on that. But it's a different scenario than DMC. Uh, DMC has had fiscal problems for years and years and years and they were going to continue to, and they were not going to be able to make the investments that they needed to make. And I believe that for DMC, and ultimately, if watched and controlled for the city of Detroit, uh, this will end up being a good move and not a bad move. I hope it is. House of Representatives in this year, what would be the impact of the implementation of this bill over the next two years? If a unified Republican Party takes over the U.S. House this year in the November elections, and the, what was the second part? Uh, what will be the impact on implementation of this bill over the next two years? I think implementation would be difficult. Uh, I think perhaps, depending upon who's, who's in leadership, depending upon personnel changes, and there will be a lot of them, uh, it will either be very, very difficult or difficult, <laughs> but perhaps no better than just difficult, kind of your B minus C plus difficult, <laughs> but it will be difficult. <laughs> Okay, so by my count, a three-part question. Uh, one issue is whether the current health care reform bill includes anything regarding tort reform. 
whether the bill does anything regarding defensive medicine, and does the bill currently under consideration about to be signed by the president do anything regarding Medicare solvency? It, there, there was talk it, that it, it, would, it has a little bit in there. There's not much. There's some pilots. Uh, there's, there, there, there's short reform. You're short reform. I'm sorry. There, there certainly are some ideas in there about trying different approaches to tort reform, uh, and but it doesn't have a huge uh, wholesale change to tort reform now. Uh, and on Medicare solvency, we could probably all give you. I mean, the, you know, the CBO has said this budget will. I mean, this bill will reduce the deficit, and that is important for Medicare solvency. It depends whether you believe the CBO numbers or not. And as Joe said, we're going to have to see over time how it plays out, because there are a lot of assumptions in that. Um, on the tort reform, we probably go all three give you our own answers on whether how important malpractice reform is. The, I think the data is pretty clear that actual malpractice is a very small number in the percentage of healthcare spending. And when we look at states where they have actually implemented tort reform, even though there's, you know, physicians will often talk about this issue of defensive medicine, and if we could get rid of defensive medicine, we'd save a lot of money, and that's probably true. The problem is when you actually look at states where there has been tort reform, the healthcare spending has not come down. And we also know about malpractice, that many poor, more people are injured by the medical care system than ever end up in the malpractice system. And so if you really were devising a system that compensated people for injuries, you'd actually be spending more than we spend today. But you may disagree. Other comments? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of speechless. <laughs> uh, door reform is an issue. Uh, it is an issue in some states more than others. Uh, Michigan has a pretty good tort reform reform bill uh, that passed some years ago. It's probably about as much reform as we are going to get. It does uh, uh, force some physicians, sorry, and I say some physicians, into practicing uh, defensive medicine when perhaps uh, they don't have to. Uh, we're, 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 if, if you take a look at where Michigan was 20 or 25 years ago with malpractice, and with, with tort reform, we were horrible, we were utterly horrible, it was awful. Physicians were leaving Michigan in droves. Uh, we did pass a tort reform bill uh, in the legislature. Uh, I can't remember whether it was John Engler or Jim Blanchard that signed it, but it was right about that time. And actually, our tort reform legislation now and the, and the laws that uh, you have to follow uh, when you file suit against a, a physician are pretty good. I think they're pretty forward-looking. Uh, for instance, if someone's going to come in and testify uh, for the plaintiff uh, in a malpractice suit, that individual who testifies for the plaintiff has to be a physician in the same specialty. Uh, you can't bring a dermatologist in to testify against a neurosurgeon, uh, which is a ridiculous example, but that's, that would have been allowed prior to the passage of our law. So we're not in bad shape in Michigan. We could be better, but we're not in bad shape, and I don't see it as an issue right now. I would disagree that the, um, the evidence is, is not strong that these laws have a big effect. But to the extent that they do, there has been a lot of state activity. So most states have done something in tort reform. So any incremental gain in terms of cost control, um, even if those laws have been effective, is, is probably pretty small. OK, well, we're going to go with one last question here to a very patient gentleman in the blue shirt in the back. Uh, thank you. This is a one-part question. <laughs> 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 Uh, you mentioned that there are uh, 50 different Medicaid programs. In some states there is less competition, and some uh, there is competition. Uh, will the uh, bill encourage competition uh, with regard to Medicaid in states where there is uh, less competition? For example, like Alabama. So, so you're talking about competition in, in the private insurance market? Yeah. Um, I, so, so those are really two different pieces. The, the, the competition would be in the exchanges among private insurers. Um, and I think that the, the, the exchanges do have the potential to increase competition. Um, it's, it's a way for smaller insurers to get in front of consumers um, and to be part of the, the menu of options. Um, and it also, I think, is going to change the nature of competition. Um, I think, as, as Marianne discussed, right now in the individual market, uh, insurers have a strong incentive to, to compete 
um, on the basis of, of, you know, cream skimming or cherry picking, you know, trying to pull off the, the healthy risks and, and spend a lot of resources avoiding covering high cost people. And so the exchanges create a level playing field that, that's going to be a disadvantage to those kind of disreputable insurance companies and, and sort of force uh, competition on the basis of, of price, quality, uh, network size. Um, and I think that'll all be positive. You know, obviously, in, there's going to be more competition in states where there's, there's lots of serious carriers. Um, but I think to the extent that it weeds out uh, carriers that are, that are you know, competing in ways that are not socially desirable, then this is a, a positive thing. Well, I want to thank you all for your very wise questions, and I want to thank our panelists for a fantastic discussion. Thank you. This is a very complicated topic, and I really want to thank our panelists for describing it in ways that we can all understand. You will be able to tell your children and grandchildren that you were here in 2010 <laughs> to talk about health care reform, and I hope some of this sticks with you. Have a good night. <laughs> Great meeting.